monkeys And people say we monkey around But we're too busy singing To put anybody down to Modern Monkey. I'm Sarah Pascoe, and throughout this series, I'll be examining anthropological explanations for modern behaviours. Human beings evolved like any other animal, but we've forgotten that. We understand ourselves as superior to the other animals because we have cars and monocles. But, <laughs> but there is animal in us still, like how we are classified as a hairless ape. Homo sapiens lost their body hair, say the history books, yet I have a chin that can grow hair in three colours. <laughs> this series is an attempt to stop ignoring the chin hairs. Instead, we are going to pluck them out and examine them closely. <laughs> Why does it persist? We all have traits and urges that might appear very antisocial to us nowadays, but they were of good use to our ancient ancestors, like, for example, I don't know, like, farting. <laughs> I promised myself I'd come up with a better example than farting after the record and add it in, but I haven't. T today, we're going to be thinking about a trait far more antisocial than farting, a behaviour even more frowned upon at dinner parties, murder. <laughs> it's a dark topic, but we have to acknowledge that killing people is something that some people do. I want to think about why. Why would such a behaviour be an evolutionary benefit? And also, why not? Like, most of us spend most of our time never killing anyone. <laughs> why is that? <laughs> We're recording today in the RAF Museum a respectful collection of machines and artillery that allows humans to execute each other from a distance. <laughs> War legitimises murder, positively encourages it. If you were to grab some scrap from your garage and invent a spiky bomb to explode Gary at work, you'll be arrested and sent to an asylum. <laughs> If you say the bomb is for Britain's enemies, any nation with oil or the French, you'll get a medal. <laughs> My mum always said that if she was going to kill somebody, nobody has ever asked her, by the way. She's just staring out of a window wistfully, and then she just turns around like, if I was going to kill somebody, <laughs> no one's asked her. If I was going to kill somebody, um, I'd do it with insulin because um, it, it kills you if you're not a type 1 diabetic, and um, it occurs naturally in the body, so they don't test for it in autopsies, which begs so many questions. <laughs> Starting with, are you threatening me? <laughs> this is a great impression of my mum. She sounds exactly like me. My mum has access to insulin because my youngest sister is a type 1 diabetic and also my mum's favourite, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> She's broken. <laughs> Why get attached? <laughs> when I think about how I would kill someone, um, I'm reminded of that Roald Dahl short story, Lamb to the Slaughter. It's about a wife who finds out that her husband is cheating on her and then so she whacks him with a frozen leg of lamb and then she puts the lamb in into the oven and cooks it and when the police come around to investigate the murder she feeds it to them for their dinner yeah getting rid of the murder weapon is so clever but um, I'm a vegan and um, <laughs> so I was thinking that if I ever find out anybody's cheating on me I'll have to kind of like pelt him with lentils um, for ages and then I'll have to put all of the lentils into a big pot and kind of cook them up with herbs and spices <laughs> and then when the police come around I'll be like oh would you like some dal <laughs> Rolled down. <laughs> yes, and then the police, maybe the chief, he'll think, oh, why did she say rolled down in that really creepy way? <laughs> maybe it's a clue. And then he'd go to the library and he'd read all of Rolled Dahl's back catalogue and he'd read that story, Lamb to the Slaughter, and go, oh, she pelted him to death with lentils. That's why he was covered in all those little small round circles. <laughs> and then I'd go to prison and I'd deserve it. <laughs> Because I think one of the worst things you can do to someone is kill them. It's just my opinion. Just my opinion. I think, I think it's out of order. Bear this in mind before you add insulin to your Ricardo delivery. <laughs> Being murdered is my biggest fear. 
uh, every single night I can't sleep because I'm so terrified that a stranger is going to break into the house and kill me. Mm -hmm. And this is an irrational fear. People say that you're much more likely to be murdered by somebody that you know. And they're probably right. I am annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is true. I sleep with a hammer in my bed um, just so I can protect myself if anyone does kind of break in. And that's why you don't see the milk tray man on TV anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I obsess about the people who kill. I'm, I'm obsessed with murderers because it's an aspect of human nature that horrifies me. And I know I'm making jokes about it and being flippant, but sometimes flippancy diminishes the fear. Like the comments I made about my sister just a moment ago, obviously I don't mean that. So she's not the favourite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm famous! <laughs> With all of our wars and genocides and Harold Shipmans, I think of human beings as being the worst. I think we must be the most vicious species on the planet. But scientists compiled a list of um, the most murderous mammals and human beings aren't even in the top 30. Uh, chinchillas kill each other more than we do. Uh, so do Californian ground squirrels. And the mammal most likely to kill their own is... The meerkat. <laughs> yep. Nearly one in five meerkat deaths are murder. <laughs> Their police force must be very overstretched. <laughs> what on earth are they arguing about? <laughs> Insurance rates? <laughs> Calm down, meerkats. Like, surely you can solve your problems by talking about them or ganging up together to eviscerate the annoying opera singer man. <laughs> If any of us was to ask a scientist, like, oh, who invented murder? Um, they will tell you that interspecies killing is a behaviour shaped by evolution. It is. That's what's weird. We have the genes to occasionally kill each other because that behaviour was of benefit to some of our ancient, ancient ancestors. Some animals never kill each other, like porcupines, even though their skin is literally covered in weapons. <laughs> The only person I've ever had murderous thoughts about is my other sister. Now, I'm not going to tell you her name to protect Cheryl's identity. <laughs> We're very close in age. I'm 18 months older than her, and for as long as I can remember, she has been there taunting me. She would do things, she would do things like this in the house. If my mum was in another room, she would slap herself round the face. Yes, you, you were correct to gasp. Slap herself round the face um, and then shout, Mum! This is such a good impression of my sister. She sounds exactly like me. And then it looked like I had hit her. She had this like red mark on her face. And that is something, by the way, I would never do. That is not my MO. I used to give mm, tiny little pinches on the, <laughs> on, on the bottom of the arm that are really painful and don't leave a mark. Perfect for long car journeys. Um, <laughs> So, the angriest I've ever been in my life, and it still scares me to remember it, I was 15 years old, I was running a bath because I um, was going out on a Saturday to meet my friend at the cinema, and just as the bath was nearly kind of um, halfway full, Cheryl took off all her clothes and she jumped into the bath, and, and I was like, get out of the bath, Cheryl! And then and she was like, are we in it? Which is the kind of thing, it, I know, it's the kind of thing she would have done, because she'd done it before, because we always had to share bath water, as is common in lots of dirty families. And, um, <laughs> And then, so eventually she got out of the bath and I was so worried I was going to be late. This is before mobile phones. People left if you weren't there on time. So I jumped in and as I did, Cheryl sauntered past the bathroom wearing the outfit that I'd laid out on the bed <laughs> to wear and I had to chase her down the street in a bath towel and then she was wiggling her bum and going, you snooze, you lose, which is like, no, it was a really kind of harsh phrase in the 90s. And um, I know, I know. And then, and I, and I couldn't catch up with her because she was wearing my shoes. And, and, no, and if I had been holding a gun or a knife or a handful of lentils, I would have used it. <laughs> I, I, it scares me to think about it now. Um, also, she got better GCSEs than me. Um, <laughs> I've got a whole episode about jealousy and I talk a lot more about Cheryl and how jealous she must be of me. So, but it's interesting, why would somebody want to kill their sibling? The phrase they use is um, sibling rivalry. This describes the competitiveness between brothers and sisters, and it exists not just because some of us are badly brought up and have terrible personalities. <laughs> there is also an evolutionary explanation. So, um, let us picture our species 100,000 years ago. Nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes living in sub-Saharan Africa. 
pair-bonded parents, they would have a set amount of resources. Whatever food or affection they have must be shared between their children. This means that feeding kids is a zero-sum game. Any food going to Cheryl is food taken away from Sarah. And give me back my biscuits, Cheryl! <laughs> Take Christina's. She shouldn't even be eating them. She's got diabetes. <laughs> Modern humans are much less likely to starve to death. Brothers and sisters needn't be competing with each other for success in the modern world, but we still feel the instinct for it. We still feel jealous and resentful. Anyone with children... Oh, <laughs> it says... Anyway. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> what, what, what I've done is I've written this. I've written, um, brothers and sisters needn't be competing with each other for success. And then there's an asterisk, and I've written, insert joke about the Millibands. <laughs> But we still feel the instinct of it. We still feel jealous and resentful. Anyone with children will know that they fight over toys and sweets and who got off with whose boyfriend. Yes, it was Cheryl. <laughs> 10,000 years is not a long time in evolution. Our biology has not forgotten our harsh, starved forager lifestyle. Here's what's so interesting about considering evolutionary explanations for modern actions. Our environment, our society, is civilised and organised. Our minds are conscious and aware. We absolutely understand we mustn't kill each other. We are taught thou shalt not kill and we obey. No matter how annoying our sisters, we allow them to survive. And yet, we contain the echoes of animal, the shadow of ancient urges. Occasionally in your life, each of you will have felt a murderous impulse. I imagine you will have suppressed it, taken a few deep breaths. If you're Steve from Chelmsford, you may well have tweeted me about it during a 2014 episode of Have I Got News For You that was repeated this year. <laughs> David Cameron isn't Prime Minister, you stupid cow. I'm going to smash your face in with your fat legs. <laughs> Thanks for your feedback, Steve. <laughs> If there is an evolutionary explanation for a behaviour, why don't we all do it, like farting? For help with understanding this, it does help to consider the other apes. So our closest ape relative is the chimpanzee. Their murder rate is 4.5%. 4.5% of all chimpanzee deaths are murder. With our actual relatives, the murder rate is only Uncle Alan, and he still claims it was an accident. <laughs> when we talk about apes being closely related, it means that, in evolutionary terms, we share a lot of our genes, and we only relatively recently diverged. Our last common ancestor with chimps was between five and seven million years ago. He was called Hairy Sue. He, well, he wasn't. I'm being silly. Uh, to try and lighten up the facty bits. Uh, we're also very closely related to the bonobo. Now, this species diverged from the common chimp about a million years ago, but it demonstrates very different behaviours. Bonobos are very peaceful, with a homicide rate of less than 1%. They are famous for being super sexy. Bonobos avoid conflict by getting off with each other. Right? <laughs> they get off with each other all the time, all the time. The females display their receptiveness 24-7, constantly. Um, they use sex to calm down any aggression in males, and they are unique in nature because they kiss on the mouth with tongues, like we do. And they also practice incest, like we do. <laughs> We don't. <laughs> Let's remind ourselves why apes kill each other. As an ape, you might kill another ape to get their food or in order to mate with their partner. You might fight to the death in order to protect your kids. This makes sense. These life or death situations are why aggression exists in our DNA in the first place. But it still feels wrong to assess human beings like other animals. We're far more sophisticated a creature. We use calculators and queuing systems. We have reason. I don't enjoy being confronted with the animal side of human nature. I am so civilised. I am not a naughty chimp. You don't see me grinning and flashing my hairy bum. Well, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have been part of that WhatsApp group. <laughs> it's for ex-boyfriends only. <laughs> It's actually very rare for adult mammals to kill each other. Wolves, coyotes, 
hyenas, they do it as well as humans and the other great apes. And for the same reasons, fighting over mates and territory. Statistically, the day someone is most likely to be murdered is their birthday. No, not the bump's gone horrifically wrong. <laughs> The actual day of our birth is the day that we're most vulnerable. So congratulations, everyone, for making it this far. <laughs> if, if you've ever had um, hamsters or watched a David Attenborough programme, you'll know that some animals eat their own young. Right? When it's your best friend, Hammy, you're watching Chow Down on Fluffy and Snowy, it does make you much warier of your own mother. <laughs> is that hunger in her eyes, or is she still sad about Princess Diana? <laughs> Parental infanticide contradicts everything we have understood about evolution so far. If all creatures are geared towards replicating their own genes, why would they eat those genes for breakfast? The answer is that if an animal is stressed or malnourished, she may judge it a bad time to be reproducing. With humans, severe stress can make a new mother consciously or subconsciously unwilling to put effort into her child. You're about to hear me being guided round the Foundling Museum by Caro Howell. She's standing me in front of a very stunning painting by Joseph Highmore, depicting the desperation of a woman contemplating infanticide. You can hear me going, yeah, yeah, like I knew anything she was talking about or anything about Western art. This is this respectable Georgian yeah. middle-class woman strangling her baby, and there is the angel pointing her back to yeah. the Foundling Hospital. And it's too much. I mean, this is an unfinished oil. Yeah. And he ends up doing, in a sense, putting it in a safe place mm. by giving you biblical metaphor and mm. Hagar and Ishmael and a kind of yeah. biblical mother who is forced to abandon her child to leave it yeah. to suck. You know, we, don't, we cannot think of a single other representation in Western art. No. You get Medeas, but that's yeah. classical yes, mythology. Yeah. That's not reality. But of course, yeah. the interesting thing is the baby is still alive. It's got a little splash mm. for its tongue and yes. it's kicking yeah. she has a choice yeah does she, she does she now, take yes. it to the hospital but of course the key to all of this is she only has a choice mm. if people support yes. the hospital yeah. to us as emotional mm. and rational beings a newborn being hurt or neglected is the most atrocious thing imaginable but in evolutionary terms a mother is better off waiting until she's in a position to successfully raise a child rather than to waste time and resources on one that is unlikely to survive. Ad break. I'd like to take a moment here to mention my range of Mother's Day cards. <laughs> I've got, thanks for not leaving me in a wheelie bin. <laughs> At least you're not a meerkat. <laughs> and don't eat me, I'm 36. <laughs> To get back to this question, why do some people kill and others don't? How is Cheryl still alive and well and walking around in my trousers? <laughs> Actually, we should consider gender here because it's a huge factor. It's very difficult for women to break into murder because it's such a male-dominated industry. <laughs> 90% of murders and 98% of mass murders are committed by men. When a woman does manage to make it, she is often referred to as a female murderer, or even worse, a murderess. <laughs> this annoys female murderesses and makes them want to work even harder at killing people and prove themselves. <laughs> Women don't like being told why their biology makes them worse at murdering, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Evolutionary theorists, they tell us that a male is more likely to benefit from aggressive behaviours. Fighting can get male status and respect and more mating. This means that for a male human, aggression equals more likely to have their genes replicated equals more and more aggression in homo sapien males. It suggested that aggressive behaviours from females would actually leave their offspring more vulnerable, less likely to survive. The example is used that a woman who goes around hitting people is much more likely to be punched herself. She should get a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> if violence makes a female human a worse mother, then of course less of her aggressive genes are going to be replicated. Instead, the successful females are the nurturing ones. They look after their bundles of genes and concentrate on keeping them alive rather than karate chopping other people. <laughs> Evolutionary theory instructs us that for millennia, men have been rewarded for fighting and women for avoiding it. 
The problem, though, with biological imperative, and especially with discussing evolution in such broad strokes, is that we always end up back with a version of early humans that have women kind of sitting around a little pink fire uh, with <laughs> cooking flowers, and um, while muscly men are hunting bears from cliff to cliff and jumping as high as the sky and being amazing. But something that cannot be flagged enough is that whatever gender of body you possess, you are on a spectrum. So we can say sweeping things like, oh, men are taller than women or women are fatter than men, but that's not true of individuals. Also, lots of people are gay, but when talking about our evolution, it's all male and female pair bonding and breeding. It excludes the reality that many people are not attracted to people of the opposite sex. Evolution, I really like it, but it's very heteronormative. Um, <laughs> it is, because it takes a male body and a female body to make a new human that may or may not be a murderer. <laughs> We must also be careful when exploring animal explanations for human behaviours that we aren't giving support to banal and unhelpful statements about boys and girls. Anytime someone makes a sweeping statement about a gender, they are wrong. And I say that as a bossy, selfish, hairy woman who is excellent at map reading. <laughs> Lots of females are unnurturing, aren't they, Mum? <laughs> And most men are diplomatic, empathetic communicators who love a gossip and fear violence as much as I do. Men, please don't feel you have to kill to keep up with your friends. <laughs> If murder is an adaptive strategy favouring the perpetrator's reproductive success, why don't we all do it? Why do barely any of us do it? The current murder rate for human beings is only 7.6 out of every 100,000 deaths, or 0.01%. That's low. This is very low, lower even than bonobos. In your face, you French kissing, your mum lunatics. <laughs> One answer is that aggressive behaviours beget aggressive behaviours. If you hit someone, you are more likely to be hit. Violence is antagonistic, and it can make the perpetrator vulnerable. The vast majority of us, then, our adaptive reproductive strategy is to avoid violence, to diffuse it, to fear it. But what decides who is who? What mechanism makes one person Fred West and another person Mahatma Gandhi? It's helpful if we think of our inherited biological imperative as our genes, as a toolbox. You're born with a whole heap of tools that were useful to your ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago, many of which you will never use. Every human being has the capacity for murderous rage, as I mentioned earlier. I'm pretty sure everyone at some time has felt it, but we have chosen to leave that tool, our hammer, under the bed. <laughs> There are many fascinating factors to this. In very, very simplistic terms, all of us have a, a lump of animal brain and then a, a hat of prefrontal cortex sitting on top, attempting to keep that animal under control. Imagine um, someone's knocked over your pint, and I'm aware this is Radio 4, and that pint is of Malbec. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but never, nevertheless, uh, you're furious and you're covered in booze. How you react will be mediated by your hippocampus, your amygdala, and your cingulate gyrus. These areas of your brain that have learned from previous experiences that build the memory of traumatic events and how to avoid them. If your prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped, you'll be much more likely to thump the pint spiller. People are more likely to be violent if their mother drank and smoked while she was pregnant. Stress is the other in utero factor. They've done these experiments on rats, and um, what they did is they stressed the mother out, so she was releasing a lot of cortisol, and um, then what they found out is that when her pups were born, they were much more aggressive. The theory goes that certain genes are switched on by environment, and so a stressed mother is a reaction to a tough environment, and so to be ready for a tough environment, the baby rats became more aggressive. Now, I don't like rat experiments. And I don't like any animal experiments. I don't think they're easily transferable to human beings. Also, I don't think I understand the people who want to do them. Like, oh, Robert, what do you do? I stress out pregnant rats. <laughs> oh, that's nice. How do you do that? I just whisper in her ear. <laughs> I don't think you can cope. <laughs> the place is so messy. <laughs> Um, the other rat experiment, though, <laughs> the, the, another one that they did on this same topic, they noticed that uh, rat pups who weren't licked by their mother, so when baby rats are born, the mother licks them a lot, 
if the mother wasn't able to do that, um, those rats grew up to be much more aggressive. It makes you think, doesn't it? You almost never see human mothers licking their babies. Um, there's this amazing study in the 1970s. A man called David Olds, um, he set up a study where he randomly allocated 400 mothers to receive home visits from nurses during pregnancy and during the first two years of their child's life. They were visited every two weeks and given training, support and advice. They were taught about nutrition and given prenatal and postnatal care. The study resulted in a 15% decrease in neglect and child abuse compared to a control group. And 15 years later, the children of mothers who had been supported had half the arrest rate of children from mothers who had received none. It, it's huge. This is such an amazing and hopeful thing. While human beings have a beast inside us, it is tamed by sociability. We all do better if we work together. Oh, that's all well and good with your liberal propaganda, Pasco, but how are we going to pay for it? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, as 90% as of murderers are male, how about we put a little tax on male income? It's just an idea. <laughs> just a, a, a few pounds every week that can be used to support low-income families, that can be used to educate and nourish young people with antisocial tendencies. I've just solved murder and the wage gap. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I am actually joking about man tax. I'm only really saying it to annoy Steve from Chelmsford. Um, this, this David Old study saved around $2.4 for every dollar spent. Antisocial behaviour costs us so much more than measures to prevent it. Spending in the short term saves on health costs, courts and prisons and mental health services in the long term. All we need is a committed cross-party initiative and someone to set up a similar system with meerkats. <laughs> but here's the positive. So I think this is positive. We as a species are de-tribalising. Over the last 400 years, human beings have been killing each other less and less. We are increasingly structuring our societies in an empathetic way. We are learning to be kind to each other. Our civilised societies depend on it. Our species has learned that peaceful behaviour is a survival technique. When we understand that the brain is a plastic machine growing in response to experiences, we realise that so many antisocial behaviours can be avoided by nurturing children. It's worth remembering that even while some human beings continue to behave atrociously to others, as a species, we are improving. We are domesticating. Let's congratulate ourselves with a nice episode of Taggart. There's been a murder. <laughs> Too busy singing, but